morning and welcome to you. My name is James Henry Alexander, Senior Pastor of the Sycamore Hill Missionary Baptist Church, and I am delighted to welcome you to our 11 o'clock virtual worship experience. We are excited that we have this opportunity to gather for prayer, for praise, and of course, proclamation. And wherever you may be located, we are honored to have you with us. Do know that as you have entered into this worship experience, you enter in as our neighbor, and as you depart, you depart as our friend. And if by chance you are looking for a church home or a place to call your own, prayerfully consider Sycamore Hill. We will love for you to be part of our family. Our doors swing open on welcome hinges. Meet us on the hill. God bless you. Welcome into the house of the Lord. We come to lift up the name of Jesus in songs and spiritual song, making melody unto the Lord. We're going to sing all our help coming from the Lord.
gave Jesus all of my troubles, and on him I've cast my every care. On this day that the Lord has made, it is with joy that Sycamore Hill Missionary Baptist Church honors and pays tribute to men who have been sent by God to be fathers and father figures. Who are these men of God? They are biological fathers, adopted fathers, stepfathers, foster fathers, godfathers, spiritual fathers, grandfathers, mentors, ministers, uncles, cousins, brothers, and friends, just to name a few. We thank God for the men of God who have received their wings in heaven and shall never be forgotten for their service of love. The scriptures provide guidance and wisdom for the men of God to live by in order to be the father and father figures needed here on earth. Proverbs, the third chapter, 11 through 12 verses from the New International Version. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Ephesians, sixth chapter, the fourth verse from the New International Version. Fathers, do not exasperate your children 
Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Proverbs 17th chapter, the sixth verse from the King James Version, and the glory of children are their fathers. And Proverbs, the 16th chapter, the ninth verse from the New King James Version, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We thank God for all men who he has given to care for and care about children of God. These men of God, who are fathers and father figures, are men of strength, wisdom, humor, courage, hope, faith, kindness, discipline, inspiration, guidance, patience, and character. We thank God for these leaders in their homes, in the church, and in the community. You are appreciated in ways beyond these words. We pray God's covering over you and ask him to grant you a walk of faith guided by his love. We pray that God will grant you good health, a loving heart, and the strength and faith to weather the storms of life. On this day, Sunday, June 20th, 2021, we thank God for his marvelous creation we call fathers and father figures. On behalf of our senior pastor, Reverend James H. Alexander, our First Lady, Reverend Amanda A. Alexander, and our church family. We wish you a happy and blessed Father's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for blessing us to wake up to see another day and to correct the things today that we did yesterday. We thank you, Father, for life and for grace and mercy. We thank you, Lord, that we're living in a world that there's a lot of turmoil, but we know that you're here to straighten these things out. We pray, God, that each and every day we as your servants will be stronger and do the things that we were put here to do and to help those that know not that there is a Savior. Father, we ask that you just lead us and guide us and help us to do what's right and to stay on the right path. And it's not for long words of prayer, Father, but the sincerity of the heart, mind, and soul. And we ask, Father, that when life on this side is over and we've done all that we can do and we've pleased you, that you will say, welcome home, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a lot of things. Now you're home to take a rest. These and all blessings rest in our son Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. This morning's scripture will be taken from Proverbs chapter 3, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 6. My son, forget not thy law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thy find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hear of his word.
wherever you may be. Gracious God, we thank you afresh for the wonderful privilege of worship, for the ways that you inject yourself and inspire us within this life to live in a more excellent way. We thank you all today for our fathers, those who have taken on the mantle of responsibility for our young ones. But most importantly, Lord, we thank you for being our father, for being the mode and the model by which we can learn and glean off of. We honor you, we thank you on such a time as this, in the name of Jesus, amen. We are delighted and excited again to celebrate all of our fathers on today. We also are mindful of those who may be experiencing or dealing with grief from the loss of a father or a father figure. So on this day, as we celebrate, we also commemorate and we are present with you during this season where emotions may change and ebb and flow. From the scripture that has been lifted, the Proverbs third chapter, simply want to come from this thought, living letters. April of 2012, after eight years of living together, my two brothers and I parted ways. Each of us relocated from New Jersey to Atlanta. Four years apart to enroll at Morehouse College. The opportunity presented itself to secure our own individual residences during our matriculation. But it just made more sense for us to live together. So for eight years, we did just that. However, after eight years, the shifts, changes in our narrative required us to part ways. My older brother got married. My younger brother got accepted into a graduate program out of state. And I was making my way for the first time to North Carolina thus marking for the first time the moment that we all would be living in a separate state at a separate time. As each of us were somewhat getting acquainted, acclimated to the departure of what was and embracing what is, we began receiving in the mail letters written from our father. Mom would call oftentimes two, three times a day, and Dad would call every so often, but Dad found it more befitting to write each of his boys' letters every month. The letters were in-depth in nature. We could not read them while multitasking for the risk of missing something meaningful. These letters were different in content for we were in different spaces and in different seasons of life. However, he identified that we needed something specifically tailored to our situations. Thus, while the content was diverse, each letter to each son contained the same goal to convey fatherly wisdom as we navigated through the onset of adulthood. I suppose that in the same vein, the third chapter of the book of Proverbs could best be described as a letter from a father to their child. We know this because the first seven chapters, the author commences the conversation with the words, my son. We are unsure when this was written or the circumstances behind its writing, but what we do know is that this father feels compelled to share some wisdom rooted in his story in order for his offspring, his son, to navigate the pending chapters of their own individual story. Truth be told, we all stand in the need of a living letter from our fathers. 
Letters that offer words of comfort, letters that offer words of correction, words of character building, and words that permit us to claim all that God desires for you and me to have. However, if you allow me to be clear, it's not the ink and paper nor the words spoken and the words shared that would make these letters come alive. Rather, when I speak of living letters, I am referring to the wisdom attached to our walk and our witness to help those coming up behind us to avoid dead ends, to recover lost things, and live a life centered on the Lord. Now, as believers, we model for others. The model set before us from the God we serve. Thus, as we encourage our fathers on today to live these letters, I believe that God has been in the business for now and then to uh, offer for us living letters. Regardless of our Asian background, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, or other differences, God is offering you and me life letters, living letters, that entail three responsibilities that are applicable to God's children. And here are those responsibilities. Living letters, first of all, encourages intentional learning. The author commences the first verse with the words, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. If we dissect this statement, we see the totality of the father's wishes for their child. He says, my son, my son, he establishes a relationship. Then he says, do not forget my teaching. He expresses a desire for the tools he's provided him to be put to use. Then he says, let your heart keep my commandments. The father extends wisdom for the journey. Truth of the matter is that in the here and now, God is echoing those same words to you and me. My child, God's claiming us as his. Do not forget my teaching. God has been preparing us for our purpose. Keep my commandments. If you use the tools God says that I have for you, everything will work out. God's living letters, God's teaching is not limited nor restricted to simply what we've seen and heard. But when God says, do not forget my teaching, God is also referring to actions. Do not forget what I taught you about love, but do not forget the love I showed you, Deuteronomy 6 and 5. Do not forget what I taught you about the path for you to follow, but do not forget what I showed you while you were walking on the path, Matthew 7 and 13. Do not forget what I taught you about waiting, but do not forget what I showed you, what will happen when you wait, Psalm 46 and 10. Allow me to unpack that for you, Deuteronomy 6 and 5 says, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all thy heart, soul, and might. That's what he taught us. But then God showed us that same love God required of us by waking us up every morning. Have you read your Bible lately? How about Matthew 7 and 13? Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter into it. God shows us an alternative when we were or are in a destructive environment. Well, have you read your Bible lately? Maybe you all know about those two. What about Psalm 46 and 10? God says, be still and know that I am God. But then God turns around and shows us that when we wait on God, God revives, God repairs, God restores, and God renews our strength. And I can't speak for you on this morning, but I celebrate God each time I draw breath because by operating in our seasons of need, God not only provides us with his word, but backs those words up in action. God is intentional. And that same intentionality is needed from the church, from Christ's followers in this day and age. Because here it is, 
in the culture of which we exist in, the media has more influence on our young people, and dare I say, our younger heart people than the church and home. And what the media does, the media creates and displays this carefree, overhyped lifestyle that is attractive due to the guarantee that each scheduled evening, rain or shine, that song, that show, that website is consistently present and communicating with the people in ways that we are not able or not willing to do. That's why Intentional learning is so important because you may be that father who works two jobs at odd hours in order to keep the lights on. Or perhaps you are that father figure who desperately wants to connect with your child, but for whatever reason, your words are falling on deaf ears. Or perhaps you aren't a biological father, but you have taken on a father role with a young person whose father is conspicuously absent. Whatever the case may be, they are more likely to gain values and instructions to help them become great men and women in life from God through you than through the world. Intentional learning. There are lessons that are important to impart early for the next generation to avoid possible painful mistakes down the road. The reasons why those lessons have to be intentional is because we know firsthand the pain that comes from the paths that sometimes we choose to take. How many of you have heard the words, don't touch the stove because it's hot? And how many of you reached out and touched it anyway? And the pain you felt was intense and somewhat unbearable, but then daddy or mama got some salve, rubbed it on your hand, hugged you, and sent you on your way? God intentionally imparts lessons to us or in some cases permit certain things to occur to us in hopes that we would be prepared for the greater test that's coming when we don't listen or attempt to do things our own way. We set ourselves up for encountering pain. But thanks be to God who does not ignore the pain we are in, but God consoles us with healing balm God embraces us with a tight-knit love. And then God dusts us off and tells us to run on. See what the end is going to be. God's living letter to his children conveys intentional learning. But I've also come to discover that within God's living letters, there exists a need to embrace interdependent living. Do not let loyalty, faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor in good repute in the sight of God and of people. Those of you who are in education, you know that a student can understand the material completely or claim to, but unless that competency is displayed on the outside, there will always be questions and potential conflict. So it's essential for that student to demonstrate outwardly what they've learned inwardly. Same thing applies to the child of God because the truth of the matter is eventually what is within us will come out of us. 
God wants us to display loyalty and faithfulness or kindness and truth or goodness and reliability. When people see our living letters, that is our heart, our motives, and our actions through the lens of the Lord, let them see our inward and outward operate interdependently. Or in other words, let them see that our inward and outward are partnering together to show others who we truly are and more importantly, whose we are. For that way, when the same is required of them, they are more comfortable opening up and being themselves because their role models in actuality modeled them. Just as a sidebar, that's Christian living. We can't serve God faithfully and truthfully if we have not bought into the requirements required of service. And what God tends to do if our inward and our outward do not line up, God will place us in a season of isolation until we get right. I remember the church I grew up in, I rebelled against certain things that I was uncomfortable with still do one of those things was singing in the primary choir the only thing that saved me while wearing those hot uncomfortable old school robes was sitting next to my friends in the choir stand so we and this may be your story too would be carrying on conversations playing around in the choir stand during service until we look up and see the look that my father would be given. Y'all know that look. The look that communicates that if you keep on playing, your life may end by the end of service. And my father would give me this look because wherever I was, I represented he and my mom. As such, there was an expectation and still is a certain expectation of me based upon who they are. Within this living letter, God has expectations of us, particularly in this season of isolation brought upon by this pandemic. These expectations are that whatever or wherever we may be, we must be an accurate reflection of the God we serve. In order to be authentic to the image of God, the Imago Dei, <clears throat> our living must be in partnership and participation with God. Because as I prepare to close, we are called to both be and make disciples of the Christ. And in order to do such, there must be some evidence of identifiable loving. The author states, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not Y'all don't mind me switching to the King James. To thy known understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And he will, he will direct your path. Now the word trust is defined as assured reliance or dependability on the character. The ability, the strength, or truth of someone or something. And you ought to know that trust is a precursor to love. And one of the most visible ways that love is expressed is through the willingness to place trust in the one 
whom that love is expressed to and you ought to know that when it comes to the Lord it's rather quite easy to trust in the Lord because every time we place our trust in the Lord the Lord responds by reaffirming his fatherly love for you and me and you ought to know that when God reaffirms his love for you and me it's not just in majestic words and actions on a massive scale but in the small silent prop things of life where we are forced to concentrate on him good day church happy father's day to you but before i go i may as well inform you that just like this father's words of advice to his son the lord offers us direction in advance of whatever we may encounter and i know i know the road gets rough and i know oh i know the burden gets heavy and there are times where you want to walk away or wave the white flag of surrender but if i could suggest to you remind you and encourage you to put your trust in the Lord because every time we trust in the Lord our trust does not return null and void every time we place our trust in the Lord the Lord has a tendency to show up and we the Lord shows up he's shown up shows out if by chance there's somebody here who needs some convincing allow the words of the songwriter to remind you and jog your memory perhaps you need a reminder of the songwriter's words tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know what says the Lord perhaps you may have to recall the old deacon saying I will trust in the Lord I, I will trust in the Lord until I die or if by chance you're like me and been through the storms and the rain sunshine heartache and pain you can take this song to the bank leave it there leave it there take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there if you trust and never doubt he will he will he will bring you out. My child, the Lord says, do not forget as you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, do not forget as you are struggling to make it through the hard seasons of life. Do not forget, as you are forced to navigate through isolation, abandonment, harassment, and disappointment, God wants to remind us to do not forget not only what God has taught, but what God has shown. That every time we need a God, God has been present. And God says, as such, trust in me. Not partially, 
not just on Sundays, not when people see you, not just when it's convenient, but trust in the Lord with all your heart. And here's the part that folks miss or deliberately ignore. Lean not to your own understanding, NIV says, insight. This is crucial because human nature dictates that we know what we know. And it's true. The challenge is we don't always know what we know. <laughs> We're not always honest and accurate with ourselves. And we'll assume that God, we got this. We don't need you for this one. We'll holler at you later. <laughs> Only to cry out, Lord, save me as Simon Peter did when we get in over our heads. But these living letters are to encapsulate the need for the presence of God. And, and, and let me be very transparent. Um, you've heard me reference and continue. It's part of my narrative, my story, my upbringing, joys and sorrows. I, I don't mind sharing stories about myself, whether they were stories that I celebrate <clears throat> or even stories that I cringe because they're part of my narrative. And when folks need to see me as a believer, they need to see me authentically, flaws and all. But I'm not ashamed to share that I failed, I've fallen, I've sinned, I've struggled. Whether you're in the pulpit or the pew, we're all human. I make mistakes. I have moments where I'm happy. I have moments where I'm sad. I have moments when I'm mad. And God has been present for all of them. And that's what these living letters are about, God's words and God's actions in our lives. That as the seasons and circumstances change, God wants us to always be reminded that God's present. And that God has a call, a charge upon our lives that supersedes whatever we're in. If you think about Matthew's mandates, the great commission, go ye therefore, there are no stipulations to where to go and also to whom it encapsulates everybody. Center of Saint, black, white, Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter what our divisions are. We are called to go ye therefore. And if we are going to properly make and be disciples, our living must convey authenticity. Don't be ashamed of your story, your hurts, your heartaches, your process of healing. I had many scars for many years playing many sports. Some unsightly, some small, some big, but I'm not afraid to show them because they're part of my story. And the scars are a sign that I've healed. So we as believers can't be ashamed to live our lives honestly and authentically to not be ashamed to show people our scars. I know people look at us in some type of way. You know, sometimes you deal with folks who have a sense of image and entitlement. You, you, your call to catch fish is greater than the critique of other fishers. So we are called to experience and express God's living letters by embodying our witness in our walk. Every Sunday, we extend two invitations. 
relationship and discipleship, interchangeable and interrelated. Relationship is forming and accepting Jesus Christ, trying God for yourself through his son, the Christ who died for us, who lived for us, rather rose from the dead for us, that we may have a life beyond this. Discipleship is choosing to follow that and modeling that for others that they may be able to experience the same joy we have. If by chance you fit in one of those categories, a desire to embrace and accept Christ as the head of your life, or to embrace discipleship by giving your heart to the Lord and giving your hand to the church, we invite you to contact us per the information shown on the screen. The doors of the church are open for you. Now may the grace of God, sacrificial love of Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us both now henceforth and forevermore. Let all God's people say, Amen.
you that's trusting in the Lord, just wave your hand. Mm. In the Lord. You got to hang on in there, in the house. Can I get a witness in here? In the Lord. Wait a minute. In the Lord. Bring it down one more time. In the Lord. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If I had Frank Williams here tonight, he would come on down. And he would tell him. He would say, in the Lord, yeah. He would say, in the Lord, yeah. Y'all don't like this tonight. And, uh, Frank would tell you, when I was sick, the Lord touched my body. We don't have him here tonight, but we got James Moore here. And I can tell you, God been good to me. He made a way out of no way. Ah! In the law. Come on, cry. In the law. In the law. Can you help us say in the law? In the Lord. <laughs>